Hey guys, so this is going to be our very first video for the entire year. It's going to be a, a long series of videos, but hopefully it gets better every single time. Um, like I've probably already told you in class, it, it's not going to change. Your lectures will be on video. You will be expected to watch these videos in order to gain your notes. I'm not going to re-lecture in class if you choose not to watch the video. You're just going to have to understand that this is the method by which we do things because it gives us so much more time in class to get things accomplished. So hopefully you don't fight me on this too much and it'll be fairly easy and fairly straightforward. Now, I've made note sheets for your ecology sections and your evolution sections and eventually I'm going to start pulling those away because one of the goals of an AP class is to kind of help you figure it out for college too. Um, some of your professors may print you slides, some of them may not. A lot of them will expect you to just take bare notes, just in your notebook or on your own paper or however it is that they choose to run their class. So the note sheets are to help guide you initially and then you're going to have to learn how to do this by yourself because this time next year for those of you who are seniors there won't be any note sheets or fill in the blanks or anything like that. This video is going to be fairly long because we have a lot to cover in this very first one so I suggest you buckle in and, and get it going. Um, I do want to remind you that I am not going to put in wait time in the video for you to write everything down. So if it's going to take you three minutes to write a section down, I'm not going to sit on here for three minutes saying absolutely nothing, waiting for you to write. There will be a five second delay or pause at the end of every slide so that you can pause this on your computer or your phone or your iPad or whatever it is you're using so that you can get down the notes that you need and then you press play and I will keep going. This is a way of trying to keep the videos as short as possible. It's going to start off a little rough. It's going to take you some time to figure out what you need to write down and what I want you to write down. And those are things I will go over with you in class. So you just got to be patient and make it happen. So here we go. This is our introduction to ecology and then we're going to delve straight into population ecology for with. Our approach for this year is we're going to start off with big things, big pictures, big ideas and concepts that you are probably very familiar with, and then we'll delve down and get smaller and smaller. So we're starting off with ecology, and ecology is the study of the interactions of organisms with each other and the environment in which they live in. So it's pretty basic. How do I behave with members of my same species? How do I behave with organisms that are not a part of my species, and how do I interact or behave in where I choose to live, in my habitat and in the environment in which I'm found. You should have this actual picture in your notes packet or your notes section, so feel free to make jottings or annotations as I, I say certain things that make sense to you or things that will help you to understand this particular um, illustrative better. So I just told you that the definition for ecology is the study of organisms and their interaction with their environment. Hopefully you figured out that by saying that definition we are talking about parts of, of this interaction that will be alive and parts are that are not alive. So we use the terms abiotic and biotic to represent those. Abiotic factors are things that are non-living, like the sun and, and water and soil, whereas biotic factors are things that are alive. They're part of a living system or a living environment, so like plants and animals and bacteria and fungus and protists and, and whatever else that you can think of that's alive. You have to think of this or picture this as a giant web, and they have all these different parts that are interconnected all of which starts off with the sun because that's our primary source of, of energy. And then we're going to turn that energy around into a lot of different forms through energy transformation so that different living things can use it. So we have to think about the soil and the rock and the weather and just every single thing, temperature, minerals, oxygen, that can interfere with how an organism lives its day-to-day -day life and how it behaves in its day-to-day -day environment. Right, so here's another um, picture that you should already have in your notes, and I just want to briefly explain what these arrows represent. So let's start with these red arrows. These red arrows that are kind of in a circle or a cycle-like system, they show the cycling of actual matter. 
things that are broken down and reassembled into other things, macromolecules and the building blocks of life. So things that we're continuously using within an ecosystem and within the biosphere, the living part of the earth. Whereas these yellow arrows, specifically these here, now in your freshman class, you we probably describe this to you as, oh, we're losing energy in this form, we're losing energy here and we're losing energy over here. I don't, I no longer want you to think of it as a loss of energy. Those yellow arrows now indicate energy that's being transformed to a lower quality of energy, which we refer to as heat, okay? So we, it's not as high quality, so we're not necessarily using it for daily life and daily activities, but it still exists. This is energy transformation. Hopefully you remember from physics, those of you who have had physics, that energy isn't created or destroyed, it merely changes form. Okay, so ecology really is based on our laws of thermodynamics, specifically that second law of thermodynamics. And to remind those of you who may not remember what that is, that's the one that says the more energy we lose, when we, we, sorry, when we increase disorder, we increase entropy. And we'll talk more about what exactly that means later on. So just remember these red Arrows are just things that are cycling within the system, things that are changing form and being used to build things and break things down, whereas these yellow arrows represent energy that's now of a lower quality that we can no longer use and cycle through the system that's being transformed into heat. And of course, this particular yellow arrow represents energy that comes from the sun, which starts this whole process to begin with. Because ecology really is all about how organisms interact with each other, we're going to look at this graph and pay attention to this graph for a little bit. So what you should be seeing here is we're looking at seaweed cover. And th this, um, this title or label right here is a little bit misleading. I want you to picture a, an area on, you know, like the, the ocean floor or something that's covered in seaweed. And we're looking at how much of that area is covered versus how much isn't covered, depending on the presence of one, both, or neither of these two living organisms, the sea urchin and the limpet. Okay, And this part, the title just gives you a little bit of description. It tells you that both of these are algae eating and that they both also can eat seaweed. And pretty much they, they just looked at an area that they had these various concentrations of these organisms to see what was happening. In AP Biology, we will do a lot of graph work, so you have got to get comfortable with looking at a graph and figuring out what that graph shows, but also figuring out how to draw a conclusion based on what that graph represents, based on what this data is showing you. So in this line right here, this line represents what happens when we have both limpets and sea urchins not being in that area of the ocean floor. And as you can see, we have a steady increase. It's, it's continuously increasing, which means that seaweed cover is increasing. So more of that space is covered by seaweed. Now this blue, whoops, sorry, moving the slide around. Hold on a second. I do that quite often. You'll get used to that. This blue line represents what happens when we remove the sea urchins, but we leave the limpets behind. And you can still see that there is, it, it increases, just not as quickly or rapidly as this purple line was increasing. So again, this line is what happens when only our urchins are removed. So these guys are removed, and these guys are left in place. Now if we go down here to this green, this green line represents what happens when only the limpets are removed. So we have sea urchins, but we, yeah, sorry about that. So we have sea urchins, but we don't have limpets, and that's what this green line shows. And as you can notice, it's a very obvious decline. Like, this is telling us right away that we're not going to have a whole lot of seaweed cover. Because if you notice, it's, it's almost at like one or, you know, two or something. It's, it's a really low number, especially as compared to, to these two lines. The red lines are control, which shows what happens when both the urchins and the limpets are present. And again, not a whole lot of seaweed cover there. That line is, is you know, pretty much at like zero or one, two, somewhere in that low range. So when you see it, when you're presented with a question like this, one of the first things you're going to have to start thinking about is, 
what is the conclusion to this data? What can I draw or what can I infer from this data? What is this data showing me? So when I look at this graph, what I would conclude, or what I'm seeing based on my results, is that when you remove both limpets and sea urchins, you're going to get the greatest increase of seaweed cover. Okay, you take them both away, and that area is just going to be overgrown with seaweed. So this indicates that both of these species has some kind of influence on seaweed distribution, where the seaweed is found and how much of that seaweed is found there. At no time during this, this, little, you know, this little slide that we're looking at should you have forgotten that we actually have three biotic factors here. The sea urchin, the limpet, and of course seaweed. Seaweed is still alive. So these two organisms have a great impact on the ability of that third organism, in this case seaweed, to be distributed properly, to be contending with its environment, to be alive, in other words, since they're, you know, they're kind of eating it. If you continue to look at the graph, you'd see that when you removed only urchins, it greatly increased our seaweed growth. Whereas when you removed only limpets, it didn't have that big of an effect. Okay, we still kind of had the same amount of seaweed present. So by this graph, the real conclusion is that sea urchins have a greater effect than limpets on limiting seaweed distribution, determining how much of an area is covered or overrun by seaweed. So some other things that can influence the ecology of an area is the climate. And if this is going to be one of those factors that's going to be abiotic, because factors isn't, you know, they're not alive. So Earth's climate changes depending on the latitude, what part of the Earth you're in, and the season that that part of the world is experiencing at the time. We can take climate and divide it into two big groups, microclimate and macroclimate. Macroclimate is all about patterns on a global and regional, a big level, in other words. Whereas microclimate is all about fine weather patterns, such as those that a specific community or a specific region of organisms would encounter. So for example, when you overturn a rock, the climate of the organisms, the, the, the climate, sorry, that those organisms experience would be microclimate. If you go within um, like a rotten tree branch or something, whatever organisms you find there, the climate they're exposed to, that would be microclimate. Whereas macroclimate would more be like, you know, the climate that mesquite on a whole is experiencing. All of the organisms that live in mesquite are experiencing this global or this widespread type of climate. So we have to think about both the macro and the micro level of climate and how those things would affect our biotic factors. So knowing that climate's going to, going to affect biotic factors, now we need to think of what affects or what makes our climate. So the first thing that comes to mind would be things like variation in light, like actual daylight versus night, you know, day versus night, and temperature, hot versus cold. You also have to think of the tilt of our Earth's axis and the rotation of our planet around that axis, which is going to determine the passage and the length of time that the sun stays in our sky. Because if, if you're, like for example, if you take Denmark or Alaska, they experience great seasons of darkness where it is, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon or three o'clock in the afternoon and the sun has already gone down for the entire day. So they literally get more nighttime than someone in the southern part of America or even in the Caribbean would experience. We have to think of our air, because we do have wet air and we have dry air. If you've ever been to Houston, you know how we always describe Houston as being muggy or humid? Well, that's wet air versus Arizona or even parts of North, you know, like North Dallas where it's that dry heat. So that would be dry air. So we got to think of what kind of air is circulating where. And of course, the angle of the sun. We also need to think about wind patterns and how those wind patterns are going to affect 
ocean currents. Now, to us in Mesquite, because we're landlocked and we're nowhere close to the ocean, that's not a big deal. But coming from the Caribbean, changing wind patterns greatly influenced our ocean currents, which greatly influenced how we behaved. Like there were seasons in the air where my mother would not let me go snorkeling or not let me go swimming because our ocean pattern changed. And our ocean pattern changed because our wind pattern changed. So they're kind of all interrelated. So why is all of this important? Well, it's all important because as your climate changes, we have some organisms that cannot easily defend themselves against climate change. Or to use another word, they can't readily adapt to climate changes. So they might have to change location, like literally change what part of the country they're found in, like our monarch butterfly, for example, or ducks that fly south for the winter. Um, if these animals are not able to migrate or they're not able to change their range or where they exist, they could die. They could become extinct, like our dodo bird, for example. Um, how do we prevent this from happening? It, it's kind of hard, but one of the things that we can do is we can predict the effects of future global climate changes based on studying the past. Look at what happened you know, hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago and how the animals then coped, and we do this by looking at the fossil record, and make adjustments as such. Ecology is also greatly dependent on an organism's ability to do homeostasis. So for those of you who've already had chemistry, I want you to think of homeostasis as being in equilibrium, kind of like the Chatelier's principle that you hopefully learned in chemistry. Um, it's the way that organisms maintain a steady internal environment. So you're not too hot, you're not too cold, you know, you can adjust your levels and change your dependencies just based on what your environment's telling you and how your body's going to react to those signals. There are two, there are one of two ways that organisms can respond to abiotic factors through homeostasis. You can either be a regulator or you can be a conformer. If you are a regulator, it just means that you keep a pretty constant internal environment even when your external conditions have changed. So for example, humans or mammals on a home would be regulators. It doesn't matter if outside is 7 degrees Fahrenheit, my normal body temperature is still going to be what it always is, about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm, I'm able to regulate my internal environment even though my environment on the outside has changed. If you are a conformer, you are the opposite of that. So your internal environment varies based on your external environments. If you think of snakes or lizards or any kind of reptile really, when it's cold outside, they're a lot colder. When it's warm outside, they're a lot warmer. So they're constantly changing positions or changing their environment so that they can be comfortable. Biogeography is all about where are living things found. If you want a little definition for that, you can say, I'm going to try and write on this. I don't write well on this, just so you know. And there we go. <laughs> Location of living things. Okay, so if I'm found in Germany, of course it's in Canada versus the Southern Caribbean, versus Iceland, where do I live and why do I live there? And it's all based on a series of questions. Okay, Do I find a particular species here because there is sufficient food, there is sufficient time for me to get there, the environment suits the needs of the organism, the habitat that this organism needs to, to exist in does exist, what, how many predators do I have? How much competition is there going to be? Is there enough water, oxygen? All of these things have to be answered when we think of where an organism is going to exist or a group of organisms are going to exist. So what's the big picture from the last 10 slides? Biological systems interact and it's not always a simple process. Abiotic and biotic factors 
can influence populations, communities, ecosystems, and the entire biosphere. Over time, species will either adapt to a circumstance or an environment, or they'll die. Or they'll move on until they find a more suitable environment. But that's pretty much their three options. Either we can do it where we are, and it's fine. We can't do it where we are, so we move. Or we can't move, and we can't do it, so we die. Those are their three options. So we're now done with the intro part, and we're going to jump into population ecology. So life takes place in populations, and you, you kind of already know this. But let's come up with a working definition for what a population is. We can define a population as a group of individuals of the same species, in the same area, at the same time. And I use the word same like three different times in this definition, but it's important. They all have to be the exact same species. They must be living in the same general area, like a pretty small area actually, and it has to be at the same time. It can't be 10 years ago you used to live here and now, you know, one of you lives here. No, it all has to be at the same time. Because all of these individuals that will make up this population are going to rely on the same resources, water, shelter, food, the regular. They are going to interact with each other and anything else that lives in that environment. And hopefully they will interbreed and repopulate the population. They'll keep their species going. So what are some things that will affect the size of a population? Again, it boils down to two of those things that we were talking about earlier, abiotic factors and biotic factors. So our abiotic factors will be things like sunlight and temperature and how much water is in that area and the kind of soil and the kind of nutrients that are in that area. Whereas our biotic factors are going to be all the other living things around us. So what are we going to eat? What's going to be our food or our prey item? How many people are going to be, when I say people, how many other organisms are going to be competing with us for that same food? So what's my competition? And don't forget, competition could be for food, for water, for shelter, for mates, a bunch of things. Um, who's going to try to eat me? And what can make me sick or give me a disease or a condition that won't allow me to be at my optimum? The other thing we have to take into consideration with population size is something called an intrinsic Interest in, ooh, sorry, I can't say that word, intrinsic factor. And those would be our adaptations. What is naturally in my DNA, in my genome, passed on to me by my parents that will give me an edge and allow me to adapt to different situations? When an ecologist talks about characterizing or describing a population, they're thinking of some very specific things. So we're going to step through what that means. When you describe a population as a biologist, one of the first things that you're going to talk about is the range of that population. Where is this organism found? Am I found from Mexico to New York? Or am I only found in a particular desert? Am I only found in a very, very specific location, like these three feet right in front of me? What is my range? How far will I go? We'll also think about things like the pattern of spacing. All organisms, no matter how close-knit they are, they're going to need space. Some of them need lots of space, and some of them need a little bit of space. You can think of a school of fish. That would be an example of animals that don't need a whole lot of space, whereas you can think of blue whales. Blue whales don't really pod unless they're trying to mate. You normally have a couple of them dispersed throughout a, a large body of water. So that would be an example of an organism that needs lots of space. The reason we think of the pattern of spacing is because that goes back to the density of that population. And the more dense your population is, the more individuals you have in that population, the more resources they're going to rely on. Then, of course, we have to think of size. How big is this population? Are we talking two or three animals? Are we talking 4,000 plants? How, how big are we talking in terms of numbers? So again, going back to range, range is going to have geological limitations. It's really going to depend on things like temperature and rainfall and food and predators. 
Okay, so another way to think of range is think of it as your hat as your habitat. What am I adapted to that I can successfully survive in? So for example, polar bear, really well adapted to a polar biome. Whereas you wouldn't see, you know, like a cheetah, for example, in a polar biome. Not adapted whatsoever. Okay, so what location, what part of the world will I be most successful in? That is going to be my range. That's where I'm going to choose to live. One of the things you're going to need to realize is that ranges change. They're not stagnant things. And a range can either expand, it gets bigger, or it can contract, it gets smaller. And your range is going to change based on the environment, based on how cold it gets, how hot it gets, how many other people are trying to live there. When I say people, I mean organisms. Um, what's going on that's making me move around? The more limited your range, the greater a risk that species is going to be at. If you can only survive successfully in a very specific location and something else is trying to encroach on that location, for example, humans, then we're going to start seeing populations becoming endangered and possibly even extinct because they have a very specific and narrow range. They can only live in a specific area no place else. So now we can talk about population spacing or population dispersal. And these literally do come in patterns. Um, within a population's geographic range, within the area that they can be found in, density is going to vary depending on the organism that we talk about. So our three main kinds of dispersal patterns are called clumped. Whoops. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hold on. Okay, let's try that again. They're called clumped or random or uniformed. So let's start off with clumped. Okay, so in a clump pattern, and by the way, clumped patterns are the most common patterns that we see in the actual wild. Um, this pattern is going to exist because of environmental conditions and mainly because environmental conditions don't tend to be uniformed. We're not going to find the same amount of water evenly distributed everywhere in the Kalahari Desert, for example. Or we're not going to find in, you know, an, a uniform distribution of grass for buffaloes to eat out in Oklahoma or in Montana or wherever they are. So how the animals arrange themselves really are going to is going to be based on where they find the most resources to meet their needs. So example of clumped would be certain kinds of plants. Like if you think of, um, I think they're called, is it blue bonnets? I think they're blue bonnets. Anyway, if you think of blue bonnets, or, you know, those bluish purplish flowers that bloom just towards the end of the spring in Texas, you don't see them everywhere, but you see, you'll see a whole set in one field. And then on the other side of the road, you may see none at all. That would be an example of a clumped pattern. There's something about that one field that allows these flowers to be successful. Whereas on the other side of the road, they don't have that same resource. So they don't grow there. Now, uniformed patterns are more based on direct interactions between individuals within the population. And one of the terms that comes to mind is territoriality. I can never say this, so hopefully I said that right. And then one of the species that comes to mind that does this a lot would be birds. So whenever we talk about uniform patterns, you'll, you'll see us mentioning or referencing birds quite a bit. Um, one of the reasons that we say it, it, it's because of direct or indirect relationships has to do a lot with, again, space. So if you look at this picture for me right here, look at how the birds in this picture are almost exactly the same distance away from each other. These are nesting birds, and they don't want to jeopardize their eggs in any way, shape, or form. They don't want any other bird coming close to their eggs other than the male and the female that gave, you know, that laid those eggs or gave rise to those genes. So they're literally going to fight and peck with everyone within a circular pattern around their nest. So it just works out that all of the birds space themselves so they're not close enough to any other bird, which gives them this very uniformed pattern 
a lot of penguins do the same thing. They're going to try to hold on to their little bit of snow, you know, their little bit of space, unless, you know, like a really bad weather system rolls in and then they'll all clump together. But for the most part, they're, they're pretty uniform. Okay, our last pattern is random. And random occurs where there's little competition. I'm sorry, I made a mistake right here. This should say competition. Where there's little antagonism or a tendency to bunch together or aggregate. A lot of plants tend to do random patterning because it's, it's just kind of where those seeds land. Wherever they land and the conditions are right, that's where they're going to germinate, that's where they're going to put down roots, and that's where they're going to grow. So this is kind of like the, you know, everything's fairly okay, so I'm just going to grow wherever I can, or I'm just going to exist wherever I can, again, based on what, where my needs are being met. But it's not directly affected by another member of my species or another member of a completely different species. Okay, and then we can describe a population based on its size. So population sizes change constantly. And it's done by either adding more individuals or removing individuals from a population. We can add through birth or we can add through immigration. And we can remove through death or through emigration. And I know immigration and immigration sound very same. But remember, coming in is with an I and leaving is with an E. One of the responsibilities that a population ecologist would have is they're going to have to figure out how big of a population they're working with. So the, there are three main methods that you can use to, de to determine this. The one that's most often used is number three, and we're going to step through all three of these. So the first method is the simplest one. Count them all. Now, it's the simplest, but it's not necessarily the easiest. The only way number one works best is if the organisms are pretty big that you can easily see them and the area that they're found in isn't very big. So you're not constantly like having to move around to count. So for a really small population of organisms that are fairly easy to see, counting works really good. But when we start talking about schools of fish or insects or how many blades of grass, Obviously, this counting of in individuals isn't going to work out very well for us. So therein comes number two. Number two is what we call the quadrant method. And what you do is you take your area that all of these, you know, this one species or this, this population is, lives that you're trying, to, you're trying to figure out, and you divide the area into quadrants. So you pretty much make a grid. And then you choose a couple of grids, or a couple of quadrants, sorry, squares in the grid, and you count all of the individuals that you find in that particular quadrant. And then you use that data to estimate the total population. So are you still counting? Yes, but you're not counting every single individual. You're counting a couple of them, and then based on the area and how many quadrants you have, you'll make an estimation. Is it a precise science? No. But it normally gets fairly close, especially if you're just looking for like a ballpark figure. Number three is called the mark and recapture technique. So a limited number of individuals, let's say about 20, are captured at random, and you mark them with either a die or a tag. So you can either like tie a tag onto them or mark them, like literally mark their, 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 ex, you know, their skin, their exoskeleton, whatever, with some kind of die. And then you release them back into their environment. At a later time, a second group of animals is captured at random, but from the same population and the percentage of marked individuals is determined. So you're pretty much capturing them to see, have I already captured and marked any of these organisms that I've just picked up? So let's say 10% of the animals in the second group is a recapture, so you've already seen these animals, you've already marked them, they have a tag of some sort on them. Then the, the original 20 represented 10% of the population, and the population is thus 200. So you're just using a percentage of what has been already captured to determine your total population. All right, so here is the formula that's used for estimating total population size. 
using the mark and recapture method. So S in this formula represents the number of individuals that are marked and released in the very first sample that you took. X represents the number of individuals marked and released in the second sample that you took. Small n, or lowercase n, represents the total number of individuals in that second sample, whereas big N, what you're actually solving for, estimates the, or yeah, is the estimated population size. So you, pretty much you take your formula and you rearrange it until you get this figure right here. The only issue with the mark and recapture method is that it comes with this huge assumption. And the assumption is that the marked individuals have the same probability of being captured as unmarked individuals. So does this method always work for us? No. So births are one of the ways that we can effectively increase a population. So now let's look at some of the factors that will affect population growth rate. The first one would be sex ratio. How many females versus how many males do we have in this population? Then you have to think of generation time. At what age do females reproduce? Do they reproduce early or can they start reproducing early or do they start reproducing, reproducing later on in, in their lifespan? We also have to think of age structure. Are the females who are at reproductive age and cohort? And that just means, are they all willing to reproduce at around the same time, or is it done like on an individual basis? Another factor that is going to influence this population's ability to reproduce and grow would be demography. And that really just deals with, between our males and our females, Who's going to stay alive longer? So if you look at this chart, you notice that our females are alive for a pretty decent amount of time, whereas our males, not so much. And, and this, these are just like ground squirrels. So it, it just goes to show that males are reckless, regardless of whether they're squirrels or whether they're boys. Okay, so we can take the same information from that table and put it into a graph. And this is what the graph is going to look like. This type of graph where we're talking specifically about the number of survivors of a species over a, you know, a given amount of time is called a survivorship curve. Okay, and it just, it just represents how long an, an animal is going to live or a bunch of animals will live based on known data or known information. When the lines are relatively straight, it normally indicates that the rate of death is pretty, rel is pretty constant. But do note, here's our female curve, here's our male curve. The males do have a lower survival rate overall than our females do. They live longer and more of them live, whereas with the males, they live for a shorter period of time and less of them live. Okay, another way that we can look at populations and, and especially the factors that age um, of reproducibility affects the population is through what we call an age structure graph. And they look like these, these weird pyramids down here. Um, <clears throat> but what these graphs show is the relative number of individuals of each age. So if you look at this part of the graph, these are very different to what you're, you're probably used to. But um, if you look at this part of the graph, it shows you the age of the individual, of the individual, so 0 to 4 all the way up to 80 plus. And then this section of the graph shows you the percentage of the population that falls within that age range. So this particular curve represents Kenya. And if you look at it, we have a lot of individuals that are within the ages of 0 to 9. About 80% of the population on either side. This, this is the male side, that's the female side. Okay, now, the reproducible years of an, a human, for the most part, now we do know that, you know, it can extend, but for the most part would be 15 to about 39. And you have a decent number of individuals in that age bracket, but what really stands out about this graph is how many individuals you have that are a lot younger. This tells you that this particular population is growing and growing rapidly. They are producing a lot of babies because we have large numbers in that young person age. That zero to um, to nine, especially, but we even the ten to fourteen. That's that's a pretty big group as well. So now this pyramid shows um, the United States, 
And again, we're going to look in those same two key areas. We're going to look at the, um, the numbers that we have in this young person range, that 0 to 14 range. And then we're going to look at the amount of persons that we have in that reproductive ability range, that um, 15 to 39. And you can see it's, it's, there's not a whole lot of difference here. It's almost straight in a way if you look at it. So not as many little ones and not as many people in in the air you know that that reproduce in the in the age range that reproduce so this tells you that yes this population is still growing i mean as long as we're not like close to zero we're, we're growing but we're doing so pretty slowly now this graph shows the same set of data but this one's for italy and if you look at our range for people between the ages of zero and fourteen very small amount of the population is in that range. If you look at the range of the pe of people who are in in the age range that allow you to reproduce between 15 and, and 39, again, fairly small amount, only about 4% of our, our total population. And then if we come up here and we look at the people who are older, they also, fairly small amount, make up that population. So this tells you that this population is what we call zero growth or even decreasing in population. We're, we're losing way more people than we're making people, if that makes sense. Okay, so these are the exact same graphs that we looked at in the slide before, but I just want to make a couple of pointers to you on how you can analyze these graphs if you're ever given them in a question or, or whatever. So one of the first things that I need you to understand is that you need to start your analysis at the base of the diagram, the base of the graph, because that's the part of the graph that represents the most current population. So when you're looking at these yourself, like on a question, this is the region that you most want to be looking at. This is where your analysis starts, and that lower region. Again, that's because this is where your most recent population is found. You also want to make sure that you're looking at this vertical difference here. You, you want to know which ones are your males which ones versus which ones are your females. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it when you're looking at these. Start with the base. Make sure you pay attention to who's a male versus who's a female. Let's go back to the survivorship curves. Again, this is just another way to represent how many individuals will survive over a certain period of time. So in this case, we are comparing three different organisms, human, a hydra, and an oyster. We're looking at survival per thousand, and we're looking at maximum lifespan for these organisms. So there are three types of curves here, a type 1 curve, a type 2 curve, and a type 3 curve. Your type 1 curve is fairly flat at the start of the curve if you look at it. Okay, This indicates that death rate is pretty low in your early life, in, in early to middle stages of life. Then it kind of drops off fairly quickly right here. So we're flat, almost continuous in this region, and then it drops off really steeply right in this region right here. And that indicates that your death rate increases among older groups. Okay, So if you're a human or a large mammal, for the most part, this is what your survivorship curve is going to look like. You produce few offspring, but you provide them with really good care so that their early life is really successful. That's why we have such a low death rate in this area. But then as they grow older, then, you know, different things take a toll, and uh, then they start to decline. They start to die. So we're going to do this on your graph. This region here, we have low death. Or you can put high survival rate, whatever you want to put. And then from about here there we have high death rate okay now what I want you to notice 
is that our high death in, in this type 1 curve is only going to occur post-reproductive years. Because if we look at where this aligns to, I know that's not the best straight line, but you, you get the point. That's what, what can we say, 80, give or take, years old, it might be, you know, more or less than that. But um, at this point in your life, you're not having babies. And in the way of nature, if you're not having babies, why are you living? Your whole purpose, I know as humans, we don't think of it this way, but in, for nature, for biology, your whole purpose is to continue your species. So at this stage of the game, you've done that. So thanks for your services. Arrivederci. Now, in your type 2 curves, <clears throat> type 2 curves would be this blue curve here. It's what we call our intermediate curve. It's pretty much a constant death rate throughout. There's no flat area that indicates that we don't have as much death in this area versus this other area. It's, it's kind of like you're, you're just constantly dying throughout. You, you have a good a chance of dying at being two days old versus a hundred years old. It's, it's just whatever. Type 3 curve, which is this red curve, which really is the opposite of our human curve. It's almost like we've taken this graph and we flipped it over. Here, we're looking at very high death rates early on, okay? And then it starts to trickle out where the death rate gets lower as you go this way. So in a type 3 curve, you have a really high death rate very young, very early on. You're dying like, you know, like flies out there. But then death rate starts to flatten out, or the curve itself, which represents death rate, starts to flatten out for those few individuals who have managed to survive to a certain point. So we can say that here we have high death rate. Whereas here, we have low death rate. So hopefully you notice on both of these curves, on both curve 1 and curve 3, there's a region right here where it kind of all goes to hell in a handbasket. Like it's at this point on our curve 1, this is where we just start dying. Whereas on this point in our curve three, this is where we, we kind of like figure out how to do this and we start living longer at least. We're not dying as rapidly. These points are called our critical points. Okay, so these are our critical points. And it's almost like that's where the magic happens. Now one thing I want to point out, when I talked about the curve one, I mentioned that we're not giving birth to as many organ as many offspring, but we are taking very good care of the few offspring we do have, which is why death rate is so low. On our type 3 curve, it is very much the opposite. We are giving birth to lots and lots of babies. So think of frogs or think of fish. You know, they just kind of have their babies and then they swim away and, you know, good luck to you. We're having lots of little ones here, hoping that a few of them will make it through and survive. So, again, very opposite to our type 1 curve. Knowing that nothing is free, what are the costs of reproduction? Well, there are some trade-offs that we're going to have to think about in terms of the organism. Survival being one of them, and reproduction being the other. One of the main costs of reproduction is the fact that reprodu increasing your, your reproduction rate may actually decrease the survival ability of the organisms who are procreating. Some things need to be taken into consideration. How old would that organism be when it first reproduces? What is the investment per organism? And the number of reproductive cycles that that organism can go through in its lifetime. So if we go back to the investment per organism, this simply means do I, you know, lay my eggs and we'll swim away or walk away? 
or do I actually rear and nurture my young? And how much am I putting in to the actual making of this new life? Am I making a shell? Am I giving them protein? Am I, are they utilizing you know, sustenance from my body? Am I carrying them for a certain period of time? All of those things would go into investment per organism. The more you invest, the heavier the cost. But then again, the greater the chances of the survival of that offspring, especially in the their early part of their life, when you, the parent, are taking maximum care of the offspring. If, on the other hand, you invest very little, you're not giving a whole lot of your body, and you're literally laying some eggs and swimming away and never seeing those offspring again, then you're not investing anything, really, into the survival rate of your, of your children or of your offspring. <clears throat> you as the individual may live longer, but the chances of all of your kids reaching maturity greatly reduced. So the ones that tend to not put as much into the reproduction, or sorry, in, into the, the rearing of children, tend to have lots of them in the hope that a few will survive. Whereas the ones that do put a lot of effort into the rearing of children only have a few because you can't give a hundred percent of yourself to tons and tons of individuals. When we look at it, we realize that natural selection favors a life history that maximizes lifetime reproductive success. If I can get you healthy and living long enough to the point where you can actually reproduce on your own, then as a parent, I have done my job. Let's look at, a, at an example of how changing the number of offspring you have and the investment in those offspring will affect the survival rate of parents. So we're looking at kestrel falcons, which are birds of prey, and we're looking at the effects of larger birds and how many chicks they have on both the male of the species and the female of the species. So this part of our bar graph is going to show when we reduce the brood size. This will be normal brood size and this would be enlarging the brood size. Note that normal broods for this species is about five to six individual chicks. So reducing the brood size would be three to four chicks, and increasing or enlarging the brood size would be seven to eight chicks. Okay, so maybe we should write those numbers down. So here we're looking at five to six offspring. Here we're looking at seven to eight offspring. And here we are looking at three to four offspring. So I know in terms of numbers, that's not that big of a difference. But look at the effects that having less or more babies have on the parents, especially in this case, the male, which is designated by this blue line. So we have a normal brood size of about five to six chicks. The male has about a 59% chance of surviving until the next winter. Whereas the female has about 60 to 61% chance of surviving until the following winter. When we make those broods bigger, when we give them when we give these parents more chicks to deal with, look at the male survival rate. He has dropped down to what about 25%? There was a 25% chance that he would live till the next winter. Whereas the female has only dropped down to about what 55% chance that she will make it to the next winter. When we reduce the brood size, we give them less chicks than they would normally have, our male expectancy goes up, way up. He has about an 85% chance that he will survive until the following winter, whereas the female has about a 100% chance that she will survive until the winter. So just changing by a few individual chicks makes such a big difference to the life expectancy of these birds. Now, let's see if we can figure out why there's such a dramatic difference between mom and dad. In the case of mom, whereas, yes, the eggs develop inside of her and she's giving, like, nutrients and bodily parts and pieces to making the actual egg and, and what supports the yolk that will eventually become this chick, after that, she kind of just sits on the nest. Whereas... Dad is the one that's really providing food for the chicks once they hatch. Now, yes, both parents will provide care. Mom will keep those, those eggs warm and she will rotate them and, you know, she will take care of the nest and, and the, the eggs within the nest. And even when 
um, the chicks are hatched, she will still take care of the chicks. But dad is really the one that's responsible for bringing food to and from. And as food resources really close to the nest get scarce, he has to travel further and further difference, distances sorry, to provide the same amount of food for his growing family. So that increases his ability to survive or the dangers that he will face a whole lot. I mean, he's going to get tired faster because he's flying back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. He is, he can be easily preyed upon or, you know, there are way more things that can happen to the male kestrel because he's leaving the nest so frequently and sometimes for great distances as opposed to the female. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, so how do organisms deal with this? Well, they come up with what we call reproductive strategies. So they figure out, how am I going to deal with these trade-offs for reproduction? I'm going to come up with a strategy. There are two ways to deal with the trade-offs. You can become what we call a case strategist or case selected, or an R strategist or R selected. So let's start with the case. If you are case selected, it means that you reproduce later on in life, you have few offspring, but you invest a lot in raising those offspring and making sure that those, uh, the, the new life can, have, can be successful and live for a fairly long period of time, at least long enough to be reproductively successful themselves. So good examples of case-selected species would be primates like humans and apes and chimpanzees and all that good stuff, and coconuts. And every year I get this question, Miss Courtney, how is a coconut a good example of something case selected? Well, I think this this is this is a Caribbean link. So here we go. Coconuts, the the same ones that you see in the grocery store that you can, you know, get coconut water out of or or whatever, are really really viable fruit, and the coconut tree puts a lot of investment into making sure the nut is big enough, into making sure there's enough nutrients in the nut to support the embryo, and then to wrapping it in all of these layers of fibrous tissue that are both watertight, okay, so they're not going to let water get through into the embryo um, unless the conditions for that are right, is buoyant, which means that it will float on any current or any, you know, it will float on water, and it's very hard for animals to get into the coconut itself and destroy the growing embryo. So that actually is a lot of investment into your, your offspring. So that's how coconuts are, or that's why coconuts are considered case selected. <clears throat> the other option is for you to be R selected. So if you're R selected, you reproduce at an early age, you can have many offspring, but you don't give a whole lot of parental care to the offspring you do have. So Good examples would be insects and a lot of plants. You know, they just have their babies and they keep on living their life. And if their baby survives, good for them. And if their baby doesn't, oh well, too sick, you know, so sad. Alright, so again, trade-offs. These are just some pictures to help you with visualizing these are selected and these case selected. Um, the trade-offs, again, that we have to consider... The number and size of our offspring, how many can we have, how big are the babies when we give birth to them, versus the survival of the offspring or the parent. Okay, this is one of my favorite cartoon pictures that kind of sums it all up perfectly. All right, and again, here are those survivorship curves, but this time we're going to add who is case-selected versus R-selected. So that type 1 curve is indicative of a case-selected organism, whereas that type 3 curve will be showcasing an R-selected organism. Okay, so population growth can be calculated. It is simply the change in your population, and we measure that by looking at the number of births in that population, how many new babies were born, minus the number of deaths, how many older um, organisms died within that population. Okay, and a graph like this indicates a growth curve, and here is our formula for calculating growth, um, and it's simply going to be our change in our population size divided by time, our change in time, is going to be equal to 
our birth rate minus our death rate. How many births versus how many deaths? All right, so we can go ahead and do an example using this particular curve. Let's look at how many more deaths occurred in 2001 versus 2000. So we're going to we change colors of pens here. We're going to be looking at this and this. So it's pretty simple. You follow the curve. You use the curve to read the graph. And you should come up with the numbers 12,000 and 16,000. <clears throat> so if we follow our formula, which says delta n over delta t is equal to b minus c. Now b and d are supposed to represent our birth rate and our death rate. But based on the graph that we're given, we're just given population and then we're given year. So we don't really know birth rate versus death rate, but we do know the population in 2001 was 1,200, and we know that the population in 2000 was 1,600. And the question I asked you was how many more deaths occurred in, tw in 2001 sorry, than in 2000. So we're still going to use those numbers. We're going to use... <clears throat> Excuse me, our 1200 is B. Oh, sorry, I was afraid that was going to happen. So we're going to use our 12,000, sorry, not 100, is B. And we're going to use our 16,000 is D. And we should get negative 4,000, right? But we don't care about this negative sign because you can't have negative deaths. So we're just going to use the number. This graph based on the data given and the question I asked you, tells us that we had 4,000 more deaths in 2000 than we did in 2001. One thing I really want to make very clear to you is that births and deaths are constant things, okay? Don't, don't interpret this as we had 4,000 deaths dead fish, like 4,000 4, of these perch, because that's what this graph shows, died, and that's all that happened. No, we still had perch that were born. We still had births taking place in this population, but we did have 4,000 more deaths than, than the previous year. So please don't think of it as, well, we just had 4,000 that died, that's it, end of story, nothing else is happening. No, we had 4,000 that died, but we also had some individuals that were born. So we can look at growth rates, population growth rates, from using two models. Model one is called the exponential model, and it's showcased in blue. So that would be this part right here. And model two is called the logistical model, or the logistic model, same thing, and it is showcased in red, this part right here. So starting off with our exponential model, um, this particular graph is supposed to represent bacteria. So starting with one bacteria, what happens to the population over a certain number of time or a certain amount of, generalization, of generations? Realize that exponential models show an idealized population in an unlimited environment. And it makes what we call a J curve. So if you follow my laser, it literally makes a J, like without the cross on top. Okay, so we call it a J curve. Wherever you see a J curve, you know you're looking at exponential growth. It cannot, this kind of growth cannot continue indefinitely. This kind of growth is the kind done by our selected species. Okay? And, yes, there is a formula. It's very similar to the formula, the generic formula that we use to calculate population growth, but this time we have something called R max and N. Now, let's go back to this part here where it talks about an unlimited environment. An unlimited environment in this case means, let me switch to a pen real quick. So an unlimited environment means that we don't have to worry about resources. We have limitless resources. Okay. 
And that's why we use the word idealized. Because hopefully you've, you, you're putting two and two together and you're thinking, well, in real life, we do have limits on resources. We only have a certain amount of water. And in a given area, we'll only have a certain amount of food. So this is very unrealistic. This J curve is very unrealistic. <clears throat> um, with logistic model, which is that S curve or this red section, this is this considers a population density that's based on growth and something else called a carrying capacity. And we'll talk later on about what a carrying capacity is. And it just means that our maximum population is limited based on resources. So there is a maximum population that a particular environment can support, and it won't go beyond that. That's why if you look at this top part of this curve, it never really extends beyond that 1500 range. It's right on 1500, never getting higher. It can get lower, but it won't get higher. And yes, this too also has a formula that's given to you right there. So let's go back and look at exponential growth again. Now, I did say it was idealized. I did say it was kind of unrealistic, and we don't really see growth like this in, in, in real life. And that, for the most part, is true, except for some very special conditions or populations. Now, one of the things, or one of the main characteristics or features of exponential growth is the fact that it's taking place with out limiting factors. We don't have to worry about resources and water and, and food and space and shelter and, and all those things. The, when we really do see exponential growth, however, is usually when a species is recovering from being endangered. And we, when I say we, this time I'm talking about humans, we're doing something to protect those species. We're putting some measures in place that prevent normal factors from influencing that population. So here I have two examples. We have the whooping crane, which is a bird that's found in Africa that has been almost extinct. And we have the African elephant. Again, an, an animal that's come very close to extinction. This guy, mostly because of meat. This guy, because of those ivory in, the, in those tusks. So if we got a generalized feature from this graph, like if we f ignored all the bumps and curves in it, we'd get a, a J-curve. Same thing here. We have that J-curve. And wherever you see that J-curve, it tells you there's exponential growth. But yes, in these two situations, we don't have those limiting factors. Humans have provided an area that's big enough to support as many animals as possible. Humans are making sure that the... The, you know, like the predators that would endanger these animals, sometimes those predators are ourselves, are for the most part kept at bay. Humans are ensuring that successful mating is taking place. There is more than enough food and water and other resources to go around. So under those kinds of situations, you will see exponential growth. And just so you know, both these animals are case selectors, not R selectors. The other thing I told you is that you tend to see exponential growth with R selectors. These, this is an example of how case selectors can do exponential growth. But again, that's with certain measures being put in place. So earlier I showed you this formula, which is how you would calculate exponential growth rate. So let's just go through and make sure you're taking down what all of those symbols mean. So again, D is delta, you know, change in whatever. N in this case is going to represent population size. T is going to be time. And R max is the maximum per capita growth rate of a particular population. So at any given time, what is the most that this population can be growing? And again, this graph shows, and I'm sorry that this line shifted. This really should have been over here somewhere. But this graph shows um, the growth rate of E. coli, which is a type of bacteria. And it shows where you start with one bacterium. And over a given amount of time, in this case, a, it should show, yeah, in about 14 hours, um, it shows how quickly this population expands. So in about 14 hours, we go from one single bacterium to about 16 
16,000, 16, however many, you know, a little over 16,000 in terms of actual population. So that that's a lot. That's a lot. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, this isn't actually thousands. The label, the axis label is missing. This should be in millions. So it's actually 16 million bacteria, not thousand. But yeah, lots of bacteria in a little bit of time. So like I've already said, it's very unrealistic to expect the majority of populations to grow exponentially. And in a way, all growth kind of starts off exponentially, but it doesn't continue exponentially. And the reason is because of natural controls. What are those natural controls going to be? They're going to be water, food, shelter, predators, all those normal things that we've already talked about. Okay? Those things exist so that populations don't go out of control. Then we also have to think of what the effects are going to be. Once these things switch out to my laser real quick sorry once these things start having an effect this isn't gonna happen anymore instead this is gonna happen we're gonna start leveling off that population every population has a max or every every area that supports a population has a maximum number of organisms that can live there without doing detriment to the actual environment and that is what your K is. K stands for carrying capacity. But don't worry, I'll give you a slide where we, we talk about K in depth. And here's that slide. So carrying capacity is the maximum population size that an environment can support with no degradation of habitat. Of habitat. So the most organisms we this area can support, not produce, but support, without the area itself being torn up to the point where it can't support life anymore. Your K capacity or your carrying capacity is going to vary with changes in resources. So when water levels fluctuate, like for example at a watering hole in the savanna in Africa, that is going to determine how many animals can live there. When there is a lot of water, you might be able to support 10 billion organisms but when the dry season comes and there is no rain and that water level starts decreasing rapidly you might only be able to support 1 million so carrying capacity changes based on the changes taking place in the actual environment so what logistic growth curves show is that as your R max declines the closer you are to that carrying capacity. Or another way to think of it is, the closer you get to the carrying capacity on your graph, the smaller your R max value is. And again, that R max value is the maximum increase rate of a population per capita. Okay. Now this is the formula that we use for logistic growth curve calculations. And it, it's similar, but notice it takes into effect the K or the carrying capacity, whereas with our exponential growth, we didn't have that because we, we had no carrying capacity. There were no limits. Um, when I first learned about logistic model versus exponential model, I always thought logistic, you know, in terms of logical, because it's not logical to think that populations can grow exponentially all the time. But I want you to know that this logistic does not refer to logical. Instead, it refers to logarithm, which hopefully you know from math. If not, we can talk about it in class. Okay, so here is an example showing how we can use that logistic growth curve um, formula. It got kind of cut off, but this should be a K right here. Hold on. K should be right there. So this graph. Well, this, this slide goes over um, what all the parts and pieces of that formula mean. So again, delta is still change, you know, D is still delta. Um, N is still your, your population size. T is still your time. R max is still the maximum per capita growth rate of the population. 
But this time we've also introduced K, and K is, in this case is going to be your carrying capacity. So to show you how you can figure out K from a graph, remember K is going to be the maximum number of organisms that an area can support without it itself being degraded. It's going to be where your graph doesn't extend beyond. So if you're looking at a graph like this, I could ask you, you know, what is the K value or what is the carrying capacity for the new cases of AIDS in the United States according to this graph? All you're going to do, take your pen or your pencil, figure out where that graph starts to level off, which is right about here. Draw a line. Okay, this isn't the best straight line, but you you know, wherever that line intersects, that is going to be your K value. So we're going to say about 45,000. So K would be equal to 45,000 in this particular example. So like I mentioned before, carrying capacity can change. And it will change based on how your population cycles at what level your population is at. One of the things that can influence your carrying capacity is your predator-prey interactions. Really, the interactions or the behaviors between predator and prey help to regulate your population. So that along with the need for food and shelter and water, they're really gonna help to control that population level so that it is not so great that the environment can't sustain it. So in this graph, you'd actually have two K values, one for the prey item, which in this case is this horseshoe hair, almost said horseshoe crab, but it's actually snowshoe hair, and another for the predator, which in this case is a lynx, also known as a bobcat. So this would be our hair, that would be our bobcat. I'm going to switch to the laser really quick. So if you look, you're going to look for where it's the most level. So if we're starting with our snowshoe here, we're following the black line, so see how it jumps up and down constantly. We're looking for where it levels off pretty easily. And that would be... Okay, sorry, this also got shifted. This black line should actually be up here. So I'm going to redraw this black line for you. There's no telling how the um, the slides get altered when I put them into the into the app that I use to make these videos. So this black line really should be up here. So this right here would be your K value for your snowshoe here. Whereas your red line should be more up here. They just got shifted. I'm sorry. Alright, so this would be your K value for your length. Okay. So notice that depending on which organism we're talking about, our K value would either be higher or lower. In this case, this guy is prey. This guy is predator. You want to have more prey than predators because you need a larger population of prey items to support your predator items. So that's why you see that difference in their carrying capacities. All right, so just to go over, we're going to compare these J-curves and S-curves. Don't forget, your J-curve is your exponential growth curve. It is indicative of organisms that are R-selected or organisms that are rebounding. They're coming back from the brink of endangerment or extinction. Sorry for the bad hand. You know, you'll be okay. But yeah, so that's what those J curves are going to represent. It's going to be a great boom in growth. There are no um, natural controls. Don't have to worry about shelter or food or predators or anything like that. That's what that J curve suggests. Whereas with your S curve, I should have used different colors, but it doesn't matter. Whereas with your S-curve, this is going to be more realistic. So this is what most populations exist in. Okay, and it introduces that K-value for the first time, that carrying capacity that we have to take into account. And that K-value is going to change depending on what the constraints of that environment is. 
how much food, how much water, how many predators, all of those things that that particular area supports. Okay, one thing I forgot to mention that I'm going to try and put in here. Once you see this leveling off that's taking place, this is going to tell you that we're not really growing the population. So population is in zero growth. And that means that the number, and it doesn't mean that we're not, you know, animals aren't dying or organisms aren't dying and organisms aren't being born, but the number of births are going to be equal to the number of deaths. So once we reach carrying capacity, growth rate is zero because the number we have born are equal to the number that we have dying. If we have a litter of four born, it means that at some point in time, we're going to lose four individuals in the population. That's how it stays at that carrying capacity. All right, so what are some things that will help us to regulate population size? Well, limiting factors, and there are two kinds. There are density-dependent limiting factors and density-independent limiting factors. Density dependent would be things that are increased because you have more individuals. So competition for food, for mates, for nesting sites. The more individuals we have, the more competition for those particular resources we will be faced with. Then we have to look at things like predators and parasites and pathogens. If an, if an animal gets sick with some kind of disease and it is part of a very dense population of animals, the chances of it passing on and not just dense population of animals, but a dense population of animals that are in contact with each other fairly often, the chances of that organ of that animal passing on that disease or that pathogen is greatly increased. So more animals will die, as opposed to an animal that's part of a population that isn't very dense and they don't necessarily come into contact with each other very often, chances are that one individual may pass it on to one or two more organisms, sometimes none at all. It'll just kind of die from the disease and then that would be it. The population itself isn't really affected. So density-dependent limiting factors is one of the first things we have to look at. One of the next things would be density-independent. And these are going to be our abiotic factors, the things we really don't have any control over. So how much sunlight is available in the area, the temperature of the area, the rainfall of the area, the natural nutrients in the soil, stuff like that. Another thing that can alter the ecology of an area and that can influence the behavior of species is something called introduced species. So another name would be non-native species. These are animals or plants or organisms that aren't naturally found in a particular area. They've been transplanted. They've been moved in um, from someplace else. And they tend to exhibit exponential growth, growth because they tend to outcompete the native species. One of the reasons is because of a loss of natural controls. Um, they may need less water. They may need less food. It just kind of depends. Because they're not from that area, they tend not to have you know, natural predators or parasites or competitors or even diseases that may or may not affect them. So things that would affect the natural population or the native population will not affect these non-native populations. They reduce the diversity of the area because since they're competing with native species, chances are they're competing and winning against the native species, which means that more species are dying out and the area is slowly being taken over by just this one or two you know, non-native populations. Good examples of these non-native species are things like the African honeybee, which I'm sure you've heard about. The gypsy moth, which you may not be as familiar with, um, kudzo, which is, this is a picture of kudzo right here, uh, zebra mussels, which are pretty interesting, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about them in, a, in another slide. There's another kind of, of plant called um, loose strife that kind of just takes over wherever it goes. So those are just some examples of non-native species that affect the ecology of an area. All right, so here's an example of what the zebra mussel looks like. This is it blown up, like, a lot, right here. 
Um, and just to give you an idea of size comparison, this, this is someone's thumb and index finger, and here's the zebra mussel. But these guys are everywhere. So if you look at this, well, you can't see the maps very well, but if you look at least these two, at at least these two maps, this shows <clears throat> um, the northern part of the United States up by the Great Lakes area. You can see that in 1988, very few cases of zebra mussel, the, where the zebra mussels are found are indicated by red dots on this map. Look at 1992. So they're encroaching from the Great Lakes area, kind of taking over um, l rivers within this region of the northern part of the United States. This is what it looks like in 1994. They're spreading. They're all the way down in the southern part of the United States now. Um, now they're kind of everywhere. They, they just take over. This is an example of a shopping cart that was thrown into one of these lakes and left there for two months. Just a regular shopping cart that is now completely covered by zebra mussels. They cause biological damage, but they also cause economic damage as well because any pipelines or um, fiber optic cable lines or anything that's running through these lake systems can be covered up and destroyed by these mussels. Okay, so along with with interfering with the diversity of these natural lakes and rivers, or the natural diversity, sorry, of these lakes and rivers, they're also encroaching on nesting sites for animals and re resulting in a loss of food for animals and, of course, the economic damage, which I just explained. All right, another example, and you don't have to necessarily write these down. These are just examples would be a type of brown tree snake that has infiltrated Guam. Um, the brown tree snake was incidentally or accidentally introduced to Guam as a stowaway on a military cargo ship from other parts of the South Pacific, and this happened after World War II. Since then, which was like, what, 1945, 1943, somewhere around there? Since then, 12 species of birds and 6 species of lizards that the snakes ate have become extinct. So they're so voracious, they're literally killing off quite a large number of bird species and lizard species that used to be native to this particular island. Um, part of the problem is Guam has no native snakes. So these birds and these lizards probably never seen a snake before in their life and definitely have no way of, of dealing with that particular predator. So they just fall victim. Interestingly enough, this map shows the dispersal of the brown tree snake and these arrows tell you where these different snakes have gone because of trading posts with or trading routes within this island. Notice Corpus Christi, Texas, kind of close to home when you consider that this is in like what the South Pacific. So when it hits co closer to home is something called kudzu, which is a vine, so it's a runner. And if you look at the map, initially it was just in the southern part of the country, but it now has spread pretty far to the northeast. It's pretty much just the, you know, the really northern parts of the country and the western parts of the country that haven't been affected. But at the rate it's going, it probably will take over pretty much everywhere really soon. Kudzu is an Asian plant that was introduced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they did it with good intentions. It was first introduced from the Centennial Exposition that was held in Philadelphia in 1876, and it was part of the Japanese display. The U.S. Department of Agriculture thought that it would be a good plant to help control erosion. Sometimes if we cut um, native plants and grasses and species down too, too much, it allows the topsoil, the part of the soil that has all the nutrients in it, to get eroded away by wind and water and other things. So they thought, well, this plant looks like a good you know, a plant with good clinging vines and good, a good root system, and it would kind of help to hold that soil in place so that we weren't you know, we weren't having erosion take place. But that was what the Department of Agriculture intended. That's not what the kudzu intended at all. So they introduced it to control erosion, and it just kind of took over, and we haven't been able to recover since. This plant grows faster than it can be chopped down or burnt or, or anything like that. Even when you cut it down, you go back in a couple of weeks, and it's right there again. So it's very, very prolific. Right, this particular graph just shows um, human population growth. 
it's just kind of interesting. Um, I'm not going to go through and, and talk about it a whole lot because it's not something we focus on. But I just thought it would be cool for you to see what, what our population curve kind of looks like in terms of our growth. So hope this wasn't too painful. I know this was a really long video. I promise that most of them are not this long. We just had a lot of information that we had to get through. So I will see you guys in class. Have a great night. Bye.